Hi guys, just a short lecture this week on immunizations. Uh, so I'm not going to go into every vaccine in detail. That would take quite a long time. And um, there's a lot better resources out there, I think, that I'll direct you to if you're curious as to um, some of the information about the different vaccines out there, what they cover, the different schedules, um, which can be kind of complicated in and of themselves. Uh, but I will talk about a couple things. So first of all, the purpose of vaccination, um, the idea behind vaccinating somebody is to give, inject something into somebody or give somebody something orally in the case of some vaccines uh, that stimulates the active immune system to respond to a specific antigen. So the idea is, is that your body will likely not encounter this pathogen because it might be kind of an odd disease or it's a pathogen that could be quite deadly if you do contact it. So we've built a vaccine for it so that we can expose you to a non-lethal form or non-pathogenic form at all early in your lifetime and then build your immunity to that. And as, as you come across those pathogens throughout your lifetime, theoretically, you won't get the disease. Um, so anyway, we define vaccines as antigenic, meaning they're going to give an immune response, but not pathogenic. So they shouldn't actually promote, uh, provoke any type of disease response in patients. However, this does happen in certain uh, populations and with certain vaccines. Our goal is to develop antibodies against specific infectious pathogen without causing any harm to our patients. Um, vaccines are one of the most successful public health initiatives in history. And um, some people will say that vaccines and clean running water are probably the two things that keep our population the healthiest. Um, and uh, I would probably agree with those two statements. So if you're looking for more information, I think the CDC is a great reference. Um, CDC.gov slash vaccines has all your recommended schedules. It has um, discussions on controversial or what I would consider quote unquote controversial topics. I really don't think they are controversial. Um, and then literature uh, on backing up positions that the CDC is making or literature representing um, why a vaccine is, is for certain populations or why it's recommended for certain points in the vaccine cycle. So all that information is available on the CDC website. So I'd encourage you to, to do some of your own research on this topic as well. Uh, there are several different types of vaccines. I'm not going to spend a lot of time going into the different ones other than the first one here, which is an attenuated live vaccine versus all the other ones. So attenuated live vaccines are um, vaccines that are treated to alter the actual pathogen itself. Um, so basically, this is some sort of either killed form of a virus or a part of a virus that could potentially be um, still pathogenic, but is maybe altered very slightly in a way that doesn't allow it to cause a full-blown disease. Um, but generally, live vaccines still have some ability to cause a more mild variation of the illness. Now, generally speaking, most patients won't have many re reactions whatsoever to it, and if they are, they're probably local or short-lived. Uh, but we do still avoid live attenuated vaccines in pregnant patients, immunosuppressed population, and most very young children. So the reason is, is because People who have a weakened immune system, so via pregnancy or via other medical conditions, or being very young, um, you can have uh, a more se severe reaction to these and actually get more of a, um, not a full-blown disease picture, but more of a um, severe clinical scenario. So we want to avoid that if we can, even though the risk is still pretty low for those types of patients, still in our best interest not to give those patients those vaccines. Otherwise, there's not a lot of contraindications to vaccines. We'll talk about a couple more here in a little bit. But the rest of the bullet points on the slide, inactivated toxoids, polysaccharide, surface antigen, there are different ways we can make a vaccine, but essentially they all do the same thing. They aren't going to cause any type of disease. They might cause a reaction or a local reaction, <clears throat> or some people get confused and they think that they're having some sort of symptoms. I hear, you know, sometimes people say, well, I got the flu shot and it gave me the flu. Well, that flu shot didn't give you the flu, but you could have had maybe some... Um, flu-like symptoms, if you want to put it that way, where you had maybe some mild malaise, maybe a low-grade fever. Sometimes that can happen just because of the fact that you're um, um, stimulating your body's own immune system, and those types of side effects can occur uh, because of that process. This is an example of a vaccine schedule. Again, you can find these on the CDC website. And I don't really have anything more to say about this. It does tell you the, the recommended dosing intervals for each vaccine. Um, and there are all types of catch-up schedules for all different age groups. So if you have a patient come to you and, you know, she's in her 20s or 30s and she said, you know, I've never been vaccinated. I was born in another country where they didn't have access to good medicine. Um, recent immigrant to the U.S. potentially would be a, a person who might be in this scenario um, who wants to get scheduled and caught up. 
that would be somebody who, you know, you could go to this reference and look at, okay, where do I start? There's a lot of vaccines out there. What's recommended for somebody this age? And the CDC has all types of guidelines for those types of scenarios. So again, um, everything from the traditional, um, from, you know, birth to, to uh, through childhood, where you're going to get the standard set of vaccinations. And then also you're going to have catch up. You're going to have um, specifics for pregnant patients. Um, you'll see certain things that are uh, recommended for catch-up versus recommended ages versus um, ranges of recommended ages for certain high-risk groups too. Um, so they'll give footnotes and say, well, we recommend uh, meningococcal for these subsets of people. Um, so there's some things like that where they'll give a caveat and say, uh, this vaccine is not recommended for all populations, but maybe certain populations at risk. Um, this is something that's based on uh, medical and other indications is what they say it is. So the reason I put this up here is these different colors correspond to a couple of different um, uh, keys here. So for example, the yellow is all persons in this category meet the age requirements who lack documentation of vaccination have no evidence of previous infection um, recommended uh, regardless of uh, whatever is going on. So basically there's no contraindications. Um, pink would be recommended if some other risk factor is present, so a lifestyle or, or whatever, and they'll clarify those in other areas of the schedule. So for example, um, if we go and look at uh, pregnancy, so more relevant to your practice here, you can see that varicella, zoster, measles, MMR are contraindicated. So those would be your live attenuated. Remember, we already talked about that, where we aren't giving those to pregnant patients because of compromised immune system and potential to cause harm in those patients. Everything else um, is pretty much fair game for pregnant patients, and of course, depending on their risk factor for some of these here. But um, sometimes I'll hear the question like, I'm pregnant, can I get the flu shot? Absolutely, you certainly can get the flu shot when you're pregnant. So um, now there is a live attenuated form of the flu shot, which is the nasal spray, um, which is um, called flu mist. Now that one would be contraindicated in pregnancy, but the standard injection is certainly recommended for pregnant patients. Okay, um, live vaccines. So for, from a vaccine perspective and like a test perspective, all I really care that you know is you should know which vaccines are live. And there are more than what the, the four on this slide, but these are the most common ones we use in the United States. So the intranasal influenza vaccine, Flumis, we just talked about that, um, uh, Zoster, or Zostavax, and the Zoster vaccines. There's a new Zoster vaccine too, which isn't out yet. Generally, these are for older patients. So um, for your practice, probably not as relevant, but possibly you could be seeing older women for sure. Um, MMR and varicella would all be your um, common, uh, common ones you're going to avoid in pregnancy. Everything else, for, for better or for worse, is pretty much fair game. Okay, so what's, what are actual precautions or contraindications against vaccine? There's only a few out there. Anaphylaxis is one, and this is pretty unpredictable for patients. So you can't really predict if somebody's going to have an anaphylaxis response unless you know that they have a history of it. So, uh, for example, if you've ever gotten a flu shot, they probably asked you if you have a history of egg allergies because the flu vaccine um, has some egg proteins in it, and it's used, they use some egg, they use <clears throat> eggs in the production process of making flu vaccine. So if you have a reaction to flu, you very well could have a reaction to the vaccine. Now, other things that can be very difficult to predict. So a lot of times it's law for any place that's giving a vaccine to have an EpiPen nearby and have some kind of a protocol in place for if a reaction does occur. Um, fortunately, a lot of these are at pharmacies or doctor's offices that, again, have to have something mandated by law that they can um, give somebody a vaccine. They have to have that um, precaution on hand, even though it's quite rare. Um, we talked about immunodeficiency in pregnancy um, and immunosuppressive therapy. This is something that might come up if your patient's undergoing cyclic chemotherapy. Um, for example, they might be under a period where for a few weeks their immune system is suppressed and then they're off chemo for a cycle. So ideally, you, in, if you're suppressing the immune system temporarily for any reason, you want to hold off on your vaccines. The reason is is not because there's really any risk. You know, certainly if you gave somebody a live vaccine, there could be risk here, but general vaccines, non-live vaccines, if you gave somebody, gave it to an immunosuppressed person, they aren't gonna get any side effects from it. Problem is their, um, their response is not as good as it would be in a healthy person with a healthy functioning immune system. So that's the key. We wanna make sure we're giving our vaccines to people who have immune systems that can actually react appropriately. Uh, acute illness. So this is one that comes up a lot too. 
Um, there's a couple of reasons why we, we want to wait till people get over their acute colds generally before we give them vaccines. And one is because if they have a fever, um, that can mask some of the allergic reaction symptoms. Now, that's a bit of a stretch because a fallout anaphylaxis is going to be way different looking than a fever, but it's possible. So that's one problem. Um, and then also, if the immune system's already ramped up, um, it could lead to a potential attack on the particles designed to build immunity. Therefore, you could end up decreasing efficacy where your system's not interacting with, with the antigen in the vaccine the way it's designed to in a person who's not going undergoing acute illness. So that's one where generally we'll just wait until that gets by. Vaccines are not, gen not really useful in acute medicine. So if somebody has to wait a week to get a vaccine, it's not a big deal. Um, now, if they're going to travel or go out of the country or something and, you know, they want to get, let's say, as a vaccine for the Zika comes out and um, somebody wants to get that before they go travel somewhere where Zika is known to be prevalent, uh, they could, uh, you know, you could work around them with that. But generally speaking, not a big deal to wait a little bit with a vaccine. Okay, autism and vaccines. So my title of the slide says it all. Uh, and my, my hope is that someday we live in a world where we actually don't have to have this discussion because it's thought of as nonsense. But um, until then, there, and until um, celebrities stop bringing this up, uh, this is seriously the issue that, that this does not seem to die. No matter how much scientific evidence we throw at it, um, people still seem to bring it up. And um, just to give you guys a little bit ba of background on it, because I've had per perfectly rationally intelligent people ask me my opinion on this. So, you know, people who aren't in the scientific community or medical community just don't fully understand. They, they've heard about it or, you know, you hear a news article about you know, Robert De Niro wanting to screen a movie about um, of the vaccine industry and how there's they're trying to cover this up and all this stuff. And they're like, well, what's what's the real truth behind that? Um, a lot of people don't have time to do their own research and don't really know how. So um, as healthcare professionals, we can hopefully educate our patients and their families on this. But the, the, the underlying story here is that there is no link to autism. Um, uh, first, I do want to give you some background information, though. So what where this first came up of was um, in about the late 90s. Um, a guy named Andrew Wakefield, who was a physician, uh, published a paper in Lancet that was a really weird paper. It was a sample size of 12 children that studied the MMR vaccine um, that showed that it could ultimately damage brain tissue. So it didn't say that these kids were going to develop autism. It didn't say anything about follow-up. It actually was all hypothetical. Um, and the Lancet, why they published it in the first place, I'm not exactly sure, but the Lancet ended up retracting the paper after sort of a public and peer review outcry. Um, and Dr. Wakefield ended up getting stripped of his medical license in the UK because of um, falsifying data and some other issues. Uh, so the question is, why exactly would Dr. Wakefield um, decide to uh, basically make some information up? Well, the, the theory is, and I don't know how well this is proven, but there's an investigative study several years ago that um, discovered that Wakefield was a shareholder in a competitive or a, um, a company or a group of people who are trying to develop a, a competitor vaccine to the current existing MMR vaccine. So they were maybe trying to come at the angle where the current one was unsafe and now we have this new one that is in fact safe and doesn't damage brain tissue. But there's been uh, no available evidence to back up any of his claims, whether the drug is um, toxic to brain tissue or causes autism. And actually every study that's looked at retrospective analysis or prospective analysis has not shown any link to autism whatsoever. Science cannot prove this. They've, people are trying and no one can do it. Um, it's something that I think we just call water under the bridge at this point and say, look, there's no scientific evidence for this. It just simply is not around. We can keep studying it. We can keep talking about it. We're not going to come. It's like beating a dead horse at this point. I don't think there's any more uh, purpose to doing this. Um, so I do get that autism is challenging and that um, people want an answer to autism. And um, so some people might think, you know, my kid's autistic. It's very challenging. So maybe if there is a cause, we need to look into it. And I, I think that's fair. But I think we've also looked into this. I think this is a, a corner that we've really explored every angle of. And I think we need to move on with our lives at this point. Um, if you're wondering about thimerosal, this is something that a lot of people say is the um, neurotoxic culprit in vaccines, and it's a mercury-based preservative. Um, now, 
besides studies showing that vaccines in general don't have a link to autism, studies have also looked at specifically thimerosal containing vaccines and shown no link to autism. However, the icing on the cake, or the cake itself, if you want to maybe think about it that way, is that thimerosal is actually, because of these scares and because of this nonsense link to autism, um, people, the, the companies have actually removed thimerosal from most vaccines. There's a couple vaccines that still have thimerosal in them. Um, most of these would be multi-dose. So thimerosal is a preservative, meaning that if you have a vial of vaccine that you can get like 10 doses out of, like flu vaccine, for example, comes this way. Um, you would have to, to be able to preserve it and give it a shelf life longer than, you know, a couple hours after you puncture it to take out uh, your first dose, you have to be able to give it a certain amount of shelf life. And to do that, you have to have some kind of preservative. And thimerosal in small amounts has been used for this. Again, proven widely to be safe and, and non-toxic to humans. And we use it in such tiny quantities in vaccines that it's really not a big deal. Um, however, the, the other interesting thing is that MMR never can, contained thimerosal. So the whole thimerosal... Um, question about whether or not this is the smoking gun that, that is causing autism or brain toxicity um, is really totally bogus because the original scare had nothing to do with thimerosal whatsoever. In fact, there was not really anything postulated specifically about the MMR, MMR vaccine that would have even lead, led to um, brain and tissue damage. Again, tons of problems with Wakefield's first study um, and thimerosal somehow ended up taking taking the fall for a lot of this, but again, was proven to be uh, was well, A is pretty much non existent in vaccines. Most vaccines come as single dose shots now. So if you do have a patient who's like, you know, I'm okay with vaccines, but thimerosal freaks me out. I don't like the idea of mercury. I don't eat fish because of mercury, blah, blah, blah. Um, what I would say to them is there are plenty of vaccines that come as single injections. Like, for example, when we do our hospital flu shots at Abbott, uh, we don't use the, the vials. We use the single dose. Um, it's a lot easier to, to um, administer. So there's there's some convenience there, too. It's a little bit more expensive, though. So sometimes in clinics and pharmacies, you might see them using those uh, multi-dose vials. Um, other common public health concerns you may hear about, uh, vaccine overload is something that has been brought up. Again, um, I want to be really clear about these things, autism, vaccine overload in aluminum, whatever, all these, all these cons I think they're borderline conspiracy theories first and foremost, but these are small subsets of patient population. If you pull the general population, most people are widely in favor of vaccines. Almost all healthcare professionals are in favor of vaccination. It's simply something that there's a very loud um, ma minority of people that just continues to bring these issues up. And it's, it's, it's devastating to public health. You see constantly um, in the news, there's cyclic outbreaks in various parts of the country. And sure enough, those places usually have very low vaccination rates. Um, so uh, these things I want to say common. Um, if you're going to take the most common concerns you're going to hear about vaccines, that's what we're talking about. But these are by no means commons. Most people don't believe in this stuff. So anyway, uh, vaccine overload. The concern that the immune system becomes weakened and overwhelmed if you give too many vaccines. Um, now, this was a uh, thing that got sparked a lot of controversy because there's a case that was settled with, uh, sorry, typo here, it was settled with the CDC and Vaccine Injury Compensation Program. Vaccine Injury Compensation Program is a program the government sets up for vaccine companies to um, compensate victims for various like reactions they might have because there's some gambling with vaccines and again people are usually getting them once maybe a few times in their life if there's a booster or a series but there's not a lot of repeated doses so you don't really know exactly what's going to happen when you give somebody a vaccine so there's this compensation program and there's a girl who had uh, encephalopathy and it worsened following the administration of multiple vaccines um, the there was never really any scientific proof that vaccinations caused this. However, there wasn't necessarily a way for the, the CDC to prove they didn't. In, in a case like this, it's very difficult. So they decided to settle with the person. And so that was something that sparked some controversy and said, well, are we giving our kids too many vaccines too quickly? And in fact, if you followed the the presidential election last year, which I don't know how you couldn't have, but let's say you're completely, you know, ignored politics altogether, which is fine. I'm not, I'm not judging you for that because it was kind of a circus. Um, but early in the Republican primaries, there were actually some prominent figures, including our current president, who maybe said some things about vaccinations, which were questionable and kind of made some off the cuff comments about, yeah, maybe I think we are giving our vaccines too many and too frequent to our, to our youngest kids. Um, these people just say things and, and they want to, you know, resonate with their base or whatever, but you get these public 
health or they get these public figures bringing this stuff up and it, it strikes fear in a lot of people and people are like, okay, so what about vaccine overload? Is this really an issue? Well, here's how I look at it, and here's how the medical community would generally view this. So infant immune system, if you think about an infant having you know, some immunity from, from what their mother has passed on to them, um, they come out pretty much exposed to a world of germs. So there's lots of viruses and bacteria and fungus in the air and on the surfaces of things they're touching. And even if our hospitals are quite clean by, by general public health standards, uh, they still have lots of bugs. So we can't sterilize the, the, the surfaces completely of everything. So you, you think about everything that uh, an infant immune system would immediately be building responses to, tons of environmental exposures. The point is, is that our, our immune system is designed to be able to respond to a ton of different threats and build immunity really quickly to those. Um, so the, the, the theory is that you could give an infant a ton of different vaccines simultaneously, and it probably isn't going to to overwhelm the immune system. There, there's really no way to know if the immune system could be or couldn't be overwhelmed. It's a theoretical concept. And um, based on what we've seen the human body capable of and building immune, immunity to so many things at such early stages, we think that there's likely a lot of flexibility with the immune system to be able to handle a lot of threats at once, or at least recognize a lot of threats at once. Um, combining vaccines during a visit does not change how the child's immune system responds. That's been scientifically proven that there's no diminished efficacy if you give them three vaccines, four vaccines, you know, versus maybe doing two uh, one month and maybe doing two more another month or something like that. The only thing you're risking there is you're, you're giving that child or infant a couple more months where they don't have um, uh, any type of coverage for that particular pathogen, and that can be potentially dangerous. Um, the amount of immuno immunogenic material in vaccines also decreased substantially over time. So there used to be more higher doses the way you could think about it, and now it's actually changed where we've got quite a bit less where we're still getting the same responses. So science shows us that we don't need as much, we're, we're using less, and that's generally the rule of medicine. When we can find we can get by with less of a dose of a medication, we're going to use the lower dose to avoid side effects or the potential for side effects. Um, I'm very against spreading out a vaccine schedule. First of all, there isn't any evidence that says that, that this is a problem. There is no um, scientific proof that says that the current schedule is overloading our immune system and diminishing efficacy. It's just not, it doesn't exist. So the, the concept of spreading out the vaccine schedule is a, a solution to fix a problem that just isn't there. And that's what I have a problem to, or that's what I have a big issue with, is why are we trying to, to make things more complicated? We're increasing clinic visits, so parents have to spend more time getting their kids in and out of the doctor's office. And granted, you know, you're, you're going in for a vaccine, it's a pretty quick visit, but it's still transit time and all that type of stuff. And, and you're using up clinic space and clinic staff resources as well. So at the end of the day, um, the, the spreading out the vaccine, I think it's, it's just, it's bogus. I don't think there's anything that, that is going to be advantageous. Now, on the, on the flip side of that, if you have a patient who says, well, vaccines are, are fine, but I just, I, I'm not sure about the amount we're giving. I'd be really more comfortable if we spread this out a little bit more. You know, if you're if you're going to pick a battle to fight, that might not be the one to fight. I mean, you, you could certainly do your, do your due diligence, and I'd recommend educating your patient that, there's there's no risk in, in following the standard schedule. But if somebody's very adamant about this, I think ultimately you have a patient who's willing to vaccinate, and that's better than somebody who's not willing to vaccinate from a public health perspective. So in that case, I would recommend um, again, picking your battle. You know, you can certainly try and convince them to do it the, the standard way, but if they really want to do it an alternate route, um, they can they can decide to do that if that's their choice. Um, aluminum is something I've read about too, aluminum toxicity. Um, so aluminum is used as an adjuvant to bolster immune response. Um, and aluminum is uh, thought to be neurotoxic if you consume a lot of it. Uh, but infants and, infants and humans, or <laughs> humans, infants are of course humans, um, infants and adults um, ingest aluminum on a regular basis. And from dietary sources, the thought is that the combined consumption that an infant would get from breast milk or other dietary sources is going to be significantly probably outweigh any amount they're going to get from a com the combination of all the vaccines together. There's not a lot of aluminum in vaccines. There's a very small amount. 
And again, scientifically, this hasn't been proven to have any um, negative outcomes on, on a child. So that again, those are the more common ones. There's some really oddball stuff out there that I'm not going to get into. You can certainly feel free to read about it. The CDC covers a lot of this stuff, too, if you want to read more in depth or read some of the papers and, and the published literature out there. Um, vaccines and big pharma. So uh, I like to talk about pharmacoeconomics here and there um, throughout these lectures and throughout this semester. So vaccines are profitable, just like most drugs. Companies wouldn't make something if they couldn't make some kind of money off of it. Um, but vaccines are tricky to make and develop because the, the, the process of making a vaccine isn't simply like if you think about a tablet with a standard medication in it, all you have to do to make that really is figure out a way to synthesize that molecule in large amounts. You get raw materials, you make a big reaction, you get your molecule, purify it, you dry it out into powder, then you add the powder and the milligrams it needs to be, put it with some lactose and some other stuff, stamp it into t to a tablet, and you're good to go. When it comes to vaccines, you've got a whole different production process where you could be synthesizing long protein chains, you're making um, parts of viruses, things like that, that just, or you're taking live um, pathogens and inactivating them. It's complicated and there's more risk to it. So yeah, vaccines are going to be more, more, more expensive than a traditional drug for sure. But the other thing about a vaccine is you think about you're giving one or two to three, depending on how many shots are in the sequence of it. Um, it's, it's hard to fathom the, the end benefit of that. So if we look at models where we look at you know, disease rates from pre-vaccine to um, current disease rates, you could say, well, economics, health healthcare economic, economicists could say, well, I'm going to look at this model and say, well, we, we hospitalized uh, 100 people a month here um, when we didn't have the vaccine and now we're hospitalizing one person a month from the disease and each hospitalization costs five thousand dollars so we're saving this much money a year now is that necessarily going to affect that one individual person well you don't know and that's the thing they're you're taking away the risk that they're going to get the disease um, so ultimately the idea is if you're vaccinating you're spending us you're investing a small amount of money and hopefully saving a large amount of money in the future and that's a lot of what we're doing in healthcare, right? All of our services cost some kind of money. Medications cost money. We try and give people the most affordable options possible, but ultimately good healthcare, good preventative medicine, and vaccines would be part of preventative medicine, keep people out of the hospital and keep people healthy. And that saves money long-term. It saves our healthcare resources for where we really need them for our sickest populations. And so vaccines, I think, you know, if you conservatively look at their models, we're, we'll save billions and billions of dollars in healthcare expenditures because of the fact that they're really eliminating large chunks of, of illnesses that we used to have to worry about now, not really concerning for us anymore. Um, so again, I said I wasn't going to go into specific vaccines. I just wanted to give an example of a vaccine. So this is Haemophilus influenza type B. Um, and this is a chart that shows the incidence of invasive HIV uh, disease from 1990 to 2010. Uh, and you can see the vaccine came out in... Oh, well, okay, let's start at the beginning. The CDC started reporting the data in 91, so we didn't have anything after that. Um, vaccine was developed in the late 1980s. So usually once a vaccine gets developed, you have some years before it really catches on. Um, so we see this plummet sort of in the late 90s, or sorry, the, the early 90s, and then by 94, 95, you have a, a rate that's practically zero. And by the 2000s and 2010s, you have a rate that's virtually non-existent. So why is this important? Well, Haemophilus influenza type B was one of the leading um, fatal causes of bacterial meningitis and bacterial disease in general in children less than five years old. So one in 200 children would develop invasive HIV, and it was 66% of kids under 18 months. So these were our vulnerable infants getting this illness, and, and it was it did have a fairly high mortality rate, comparatively speaking, to some other illnesses we see. So the, the advent of this disease, we're seeing um, much less cases. So between 2003, 2010, um, case average 250, 2,562 per year, and 398 would involve children under age five. So we're seeing a big shift in who's getting HIV, uh, the, the Haemophilus influenza type B infections, maybe quite a bit older population than we used to see. So it's not really our vaccinated folks. Most of the folks under five, or most of the little kids under five getting their vaccines 
and we're seeing a very small amount of patients in that area. And most of them getting it either are getting weird strains of it or they're probably not vaccinated. Um, I just want to bring up the concept of her herd immunity quick at the final slide here and protecting those most vulnerable. So um, community immunity, if you haven't heard of herd immunity, is a concept that if you vaccinate the most people, you're going to protect those who are not vaccinated. So think about a room full of 100 dots. And I wish that maybe I have a drawing up here would be more helpful, but you'll have to bear with me and use your imagination. So a room full of 100 dots. And let's say all those dots are red except for two of them uh, are blue. And so the two blue dots are two people who are um, immunocompromised. Let's say one's a transplant patient um, who has to be on immunosuppressive drugs, and the other person is a, uh, I don't know, what other immunocompromised, let's say the other person's pregnant. I don't know. Who knows? It doesn't matter. They're immunocompromised and they can't get certain vaccines. So if we vaccinate everybody else um, and all those other 98 dots are vaccinated, the odds of those two people coming into contact with each other and giving each other the disease, because one might have it and carry it or be sick with it and could pass it on to the other ones, those people who are vaccinated act as a shield or a buffer. So the idea is that that vaccine can't travel between hosts because people are immune to it. Uh, so the, the concept of herd immunity is really important because if people decide for whatever reason, hey, I'm healthy, my kids don't need vaccines, then that's only for people who are sick and getting diseases naturally is more um, beneficial than, getting, than get, building immunity via artificial methods, aka vaccination. Um, that's some of the arguments you might hear. That affects herd immunity because you're having people in the community electively choosing not to vaccinate themselves and their children. And what happens is, is that you have more gaps there. So that disease could spread to those people. And yeah, those people might be healthy, fit people who don't really get an experience with the disease. Maybe they get a mild cold and they pass it on to somebody else. But eventually that disease gets to somebody who's immunocompromised and that person dies because of it. Um, so that's where her herd immunity becomes this really important shield to protect our most vulnerable patient populations. My, um, there, there's an article that I, I read a long time ago that was, well, maybe not that long ago, several years ago, um, about a, a mother and kind of her experience with this. And I think it's a, it was a good one that would resonate with the non-medical um, community. And the concept was pretty simple. It was just about a child who had um, a... Uh, a childhood leukemia, meaning that they're heavily immunocompromised, and the fact that there were kids in her community who were, or parents who were choosing not to vaccinate their children, and was putting her kid at risk who couldn't choose to get certain vaccines. So MMR, for example. So the concept of this is really important because we have to remember that by making choices not to vaccinate, we're putting people like this at risk who don't have the choice, who have to rely on herd immunity to protect them because they don't. Um, they don't have the, the ability to get a, a certain vaccine. And that's where this becomes really important for us as a community to embrace vaccination and to be able to say, look, um, I have some personal beliefs about this, but the science weighs out my personal beliefs. And I think that protecting our, um, our most vulnerable citizens, our kids and our, our immunocompromised adults is more important than some of my personal beliefs on the matter. And I think that's where really we need to go as a society. Hopefully we'll get there at some point, but I've probably done enough preaching for now. Um, ultimately, again, if you really want to dig into some more of the vaccines specifically, I'd recommend looking at um, the CDC. And as far as a test, test situation goes, I really just want you to know from my perspective and my questions to know what the live vaccines are. That's what I'll test you on. So thanks for listening, guys. I'll uh, talk to you next week about infectious disease of all types.